meeting of the St. Mary's County Board of Education for Wednesday, April 12, 2023. We will begin with the pledge. Okay. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. May I have a motion to approve the agenda? I move approval of the agenda as presented. Oh, second? Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Motion is carried. We will begin with the superintendent and student member reports. All righty. Um, well, it's April. It's the fourth marking period. It is. It has begun. We, uh, we are here. Um, right after our last board meeting we had the state of the schools on the very next day on march 23rd where we uh, sponsored by a whole host of local businesses under the umbrella of the chamber of commerce we had a really nice turnout we had several county commissioners there as well as all of the board members it was it was a great it was a great lunch i think it was a great conversation um, we focused on our incredible secondary students and uh, across all three high schools they had people in Fairlead Academy they had representative from each one of the each one of the high schools they also had representatives from the four center programming as well as the apprenticeship Maryland slash tech job rules at all the tables and I heard from all attending especially people that own more substantial businesses um, how impressed they were with our with our students and how they are very very interested if they don't have an apprentice in becoming part of a program to have an apprentice moving forward so I think it was a great day it was really well done thank you very much for everybody who coordinated and helped to make that uh, a, a wonderful day it is available on YouTube if you want to watch a very long presentation but it is there there's a lot of good information and it's worth a, it's worth a view Right after that, we had our teacher job fair on Saturday with every single one of our schools represented, sending out administrators and teachers and conducting interviews throughout the entire morning. And, and it was really, it was just, it, was a, it just felt really good. It was a really good day. Captain Walter Francis Duke in the, in the gymnasium, a beautiful space. Um, a lot of people were interviewing. We were interviewing people from um, other counties who were coming down to take a look at us to consider maybe uh, moving down to the mother county, moving you know, down to uh, St. Mary's County. It was a really productive day. Thank you very much to the Department of Human Resources for organizing and to every single school for sending a team and having a table and having all the school swag. Um, it was great, as well as all the central office <coughs> staff that was there to support as well and to let everybody know what makes St. Mary's County Public Schools special. The good news is uh, the last slide talks about a virtual fair that's coming up, um, well, tomorrow. So come work for us visit our new website hit the big red button be a member of an incredibly fantastic group of people uh the high school musicals um greece fantastic music man fantastic um we have mean girls coming up in uh not this weekend but next weekend at uh, chopticon high school be there or be square they are fantastic performances uh, we also had Leonardtown Middle School did a sister act um, right before we were before the last board meeting. Um, coming up next, we have the um, Esperanza Middle School, Adams Family Junior, the Chesapeake Public Charter School, Cinderella. So you can go to one on one night, one the other on the other. Um, and then we get into May, we have Annie Junior and Matilda Junior. All of these are fantastic productions. And most importantly, um, the, the parents and the teachers who are spending all the time working with kids, these are, these are super large casts. You know, 30, 40, 50 students all involved in work. And that's ju it's just great. Uh, the, the joy that you see in our buildings with those presentations, it's, it's just really fantastic. Please go out and see one. Um, April, wow, we, are, we have way too many check marks. We are not April 19th. We're not all the way to 19th. We need to delete some of those check marks. Um, we are through spring break. And we are through, oh my gosh, I'm behind. Um, we are at the board meeting, uh, but uh, we have not done the 13th, 14th, 17th, 18th, 19th yet, but you know, of course eventually we will. 
Um, the virtual fair for uh, all of us, anybody interested in joining St. Mary's County Public Schools goes on tomorrow. The Special Olympics uh, it's, uh, at Spring Ridge Middle School, that's tomorrow. Our report cards are going to be distributed next Wednesday. Then we have Mean Girls opening at Chopticon High School. And on the 21st, that was the two-hour early release day, but is now going to be a virtual day. Um, so the beginning of the day is going to be done virtually, and the afternoon is for teachers for professional responsibilities. And we can finish with going to see Cinderella or Mean Girls or Adam's Family Juniors. There are all kinds of theatrical choices. Um, then we have uh, the last week of April with the commissioners uh, of St. Mary's County, the public hearing on the 2024 budget uh, on the 25th, and I think it is at Chapticon High School. Um, we will be going out to thank our commissioners for a... Um, uh, a very um, non-stressful uh, budget season where we really talked about um, what was available, what we needed, and how we can all work together to make sure that we take care of our people who take care of our kids. Um, so that is the month of April. But before we went away to spring break, Miss <coughs> Iswara, man, she kept me busy. We were all over the place. We were finishing up the middle school visits. Mm -hmm. So with that, I shall turn it over to the student member of the board. Yeah, hooray, we're done with the school visits. Yes. We've officially visited <laughs> all of the schools in St. Mary's County Public Schools, which is very, very exciting. I'm not excited to be done, as in like I wish I'd just keep doing this forever, but I am excited to be done because it means that we accomplished what we started. So that is exciting. Um, we first touched Esperanza Middle School, which was actually where I went to middle school, so that was exciting mm -hmm. for me. Um, we forgot to take a picture, so that's just a picture of the students we met. They later with. gathered um, together. Yeah. The principal Consalvo did that for us, so that's everybody we met with. Yeah. So um, at Esperanza, we um, talked a lot about um, like content and um, like content structure, um, like what those students felt would be um, like good to read, maybe in their English classes or um, maybe like how lesson plans could be laid out more um, efficiently for students because the biggest struggle right now with middle school is scheduling mm -hmm. um, just because double blocks are really hard to sit through um, but then that transition straight to 45 minutes is like a huge gap from elementary school where you spend the whole day with the same people so it's just this weird limo where we're just trying to figure that out um, and so we got a lot of great student input from the kids at Esperanza and then um, the next day we visited Spring Ridge Middle School and um, this was a very big group which was exciting oh, yeah. um, because their, uh, their setup for their um, like student government is that they have a representative from every homeroom class which is great. That's a very, very smart um, way of like information dispersion as well because that means that each of those kids got to go back to their homerooms and you know talk about what they talked about with us. Um, they shared a lot of great things. We talked a lot about the Tech Center while we were at Spring Ridge, um, and a lot of those kids are already planning on participating in Tech Center programs during their time in high school, which is exciting because that's exactly what we want people to do. We want them to um, take advantage of all of the opportunities that we have um, in our school system. And then um, at Margaret Brent, we talked a lot about student engagement. Um, kind of in the activities and the opportunities that already exist, how to really make those um, engaging for students and also just like um, interesting almost because um, oftentimes we have things to do but students don't know what they need to do to you know kind of like throw themselves into that or they don't um, you know they're hesitant to because they don't you know know another person who has or you know anything like that so we just talked a lot about all of that because all of that is related to the blueprint for Maryland's future which is um, what we kind of uh, explained to them as like the um, background piece for um, our, our talks last, or not last week, the week before last. Um, so that's Blueprint Pillar 3 and Blueprint Pillar 4. So that's college and career readiness and resources um, to ensure all students are successful. So um, that's what we were stressing to them and we got feedback about how we can better implement those pillars. So um, very successful visits in all. And um, just a word in general, um, I, this is like the best part of my year, um, getting to talk to students 
from all across SMCPS, um, five or like from fifth grade all the way to um, kids who are seniors this year. I mean, I'm a senior this year, but it's nice to hear from other seniors too, um, because a lot of them have been with our system since we were in you know pre-K kindergarten, so they've experienced the whole thing. Um, and talking to everyone. I don't know, it's just, it's, it's great to see um, how well our students are doing and um, how tight-knit our school communities are, so that was great. Um, and apart from that, I just wanted to say, one of the middle schools is doing Annie Junior this year. Mm -hmm. I was an Annie Junior in fifth grade. <laughs> I was Molly, the orphan. Aww. Aww. Anyway, <laughs> I just had to say that. But yeah, that's it for me. Oh, wait, no, 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 that's not it for me. So I sorry. Was say. So sorry. I have one big thing, actually. Okay, so Manasa, she's a senior, right? Oh, she's a senior. She's not going to be here next year. We elected a new smob in March. So Lillian Kibler is sitting over here. Um, she is the newly elected smob for school year 23 24. And um, she had competition. There were two other candidates mm -hmm. this year. And they were all great candidates, but um, SMASC, St. Mary's Association of Student Councils, votes. And they voted for Lily. So, congratulations. congratulations. <laughs> yes. That'll and um, I have worked with Lily closely for many years now um, in student government. And it, we have classes together. So um, I know that she is a, a wonderful, wonderful student. And she works diligently at everything she does. So. Lily, I am looking forward to see what you do with your term. Um, and yeah, you're gonna do great. Yeah, so that, that was my big thing, I forgot. All right. Well, and again, teacher job fair tomorrow from four to seven. So if you weren't able to join us in person, and that's okay, but you missed out, it was a great it was a great morning. If not, um, you can certainly join us virtually. And uh, there's the LinkedIn uh, page you can go to. You can hit our website. You can put it's in our scroller. All you need to know is smcps.org, um, and that'll get you that'll get you started. There's a QR code there. These flyers are all around. Um, please consider. Uh, joining uh, St. Mary's County Public Schools because you get to work with these incredible kids, mm. right? How awesome is that? So awesome. And with that, thank you very much. Okay. We have no recognition to public hearing, public comment. Yes, one, Ms. Teresa Black. Okay. Um, I will read the statement if you want to come up here and then uh, give three minutes so Kim will start the timer after I'm finished. So we welcome public input on policies and issues affecting our school. We take this time to listen and consider but not comment. This is not the appropriate form for negative comments or criticisms of indiv individual staff or students. Um, concerns about individual staff members that cannot be resolved at the level closest to the situation should be directed to the superintendent. Um, please keep in mind we also sit as an appellate body in both student and employee appeals so we cannot comment on or have prior knowledge of a case that may come before the board. Uh, the speaker signed at the beginning of the meeting. You have three minutes per speaker and you may not yield your time to someone else and if you have any written comments if you give them to Kim and she'll put them in our board docs at the end of the meeting. Thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, hi, I'm here to talk about the virtual schooling initiative that was put forth uh, during the last meeting. Uh, ultimately, I don't feel that the appropriate uh, uh, voting was put in by parents. Not that it mattered anyway. I was told um, that our votes didn't really matter because the board was the one making the decision at the end of the day. Um, but ultimately, our school did not release the survey until after the board, the board had already closed, the survey had already closed. Um, but additionally, um, I watched the board meeting and I don't think that the appropriate things were taken into account. So when one of the board members stated that everyone doesn't have access to high-speed internet, that was countered with, yes, they do, they do not. Uh, my home specifically has no cables for high-speed internet um, and I know that all the homes in my little area do not have them either uh, because of the fact that they're new homes and they did not build them. And when we asked for them to be placed in, they said they would and it's been about six months now and we still don't have it. Um, the students who do not have access to breakfast uh, and lunch outside of school were not taken into account. Uh, we are taking away their meals, their safe place in the event that they need that at the schools. And so to say that the teachers aren't showing up to school and so we should allow them to not show up to school, like to, to we should make students stay home um, and not receive their education uh, doesn't make any sense to me. Uh, a lot of the, the, the comments that were brought up saying how it would work would, 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 in regards to high school and middle school students, complete disregard for elementary skill, um, age kids who obviously have difficulty learning in a virtual setting. Um, the Harvard study that went, uh, that, that obviously um, talked about the problems with virtual schooling for young children, 
um, discussed that there was rise in tantrums, anxiety, depression amongst young children when they are put in virtual schooling settings. Uh, ultimately, you said that you were testing whether or not virtual schooling would work. However, no actual test has been put in place, like finding out if when the teachers teach virtually, whether the students are absorbing that information by teaching a lesson on that Friday and then on that following Monday testing that information to see if they actually absorbed it. Uh, the fact is that during that board meeting, essentially, I mean, it was actually stated that this is essentially a three-day weekend uh, because they were not expecting students to learn through this virtual, this virtual platform. Those exact words were, be, were used in that board meeting. That doesn't make any sense. If we're going to not have school on that day, then don't have school. I understand that we are required to allow the teachers to have a half day every marking period in order to catch up. Well, there's nothing saying they can't have the full day. If you're saying that we cannot do that, like if we're saying that we cannot have the teachers showing up, we can either use a hybrid system because apparently a lot of the teachers, I mean, a lot of the parents that actually took the survey said they agreed with the virtual schooling. So if we're going to have, if, if a lot of the teachers agree, if a lot of the parents agreed, then there's no reason why we wouldn't give the option to parents to have a hybrid so that if they need to send their kids to school because they cannot take off of work and they don't have high-speed internet or their children need a safe place or they need food for the day, they can come into school. And the student, because you, you guys said the teachers are already going to be in the schools on those days anyway. I guess that's my time. I guess I'll come back next time. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. May I have a motion to approve the consent agenda? Today's <laughs> consent agenda consists of the approval of minutes for March 22nd, 2023, personnel, administrative and supervisory, personnel teachers, Lowe's, maintenance, repair and operations, supplies and related services, WW Granger Incorporated source well contract for maintenance, repair and operating supplies, security camera installation, service and maintenance, um, cafeteria tables for Piney Point Elementary School, contract for the installation of security window film and system-wide Konica Minolta multifunction devices equipment refresh. And as such, I um, move approval of the consent agenda as presented. Do we have a second? Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? The motion is carried. We have one action item this morning and that is Dr. Beavers, uh, more classroom furniture. Scott's clicker broke it again. All right, good morning. Good morning. Good morning. I am sitting in for Miss Paola Laino today. She is sorry that she can't be here, but I told her that she was in good hands. I guess we'll decide when I'm done <laughs> whether that was a true statement or not. Um, <clears throat> I'm here this morning to request approval to award two contracts to Doron Inc. in the amount of $277,018.37 for Oakville Elementary School in the amount of $65,126.75 for Greenview Knowles Elementary School 
totaling $342,145.12 to provide, deliver, and install classroom and administrative office furnishings at Oakville and student chairs at Greenview Mills. Uh, unrestricted funds will be used uh, for, this, for this purchase. Uh, furniture replacement is scheduled to take place during this summer uh, so that will not interrupt uh, students and teachers. Uh, the disposal of existing furniture is set to happen between the 12th and 16th of June. The assembly of the new furniture will arrive and be assembled uh, between the 19th and 29th, and then obviously would be prepared for occupancy by June 30th, which I don't believe students are going to be uh, running back to come at June 30th, but it will be there if they <laughs> choose to do so. I know that we have some summer things going on, so uh, maybe they will get some use. <clears throat> Uh, the current furniture, as you can see from the pictures, uh, we have some damages or excessively worn furniture throughout, uh, some mismatched furniture, uh, some furniture that's missing screws and hardware or not the right size for primary students. Both of these schools, uh, Greenview Knowles uh, was built in 65 and has had four editions, 71, 90, 97, and 2009. So you, you can, over a period of time like that, when you're scraping together furniture or purchasing new, nothing is going to match at that point. Um, and we feel like some of the furniture dates back to the 60s, so it's, it's time, as you can tell from the pictures. Um, Oakville, again, uh, original building, 66, additions in 76, 98, 2005, so same situation there. Um, again, this is uh, Greenview Knowles, damage, same, same condition, damaged and excessively worn furniture, mismatched chairs, missing screws and hardware, inappropriate size, and then uh, a lot of them aren't designed for tile, which creates a problem there for operations as well. Uh, we're providing furniture at Oakville for the administrative areas, which includes administration, the health suite and reception, and then there are also 13 classrooms, two special ed rooms, the art, music and band and strings rooms, the guidance office, speech office, uh, psychologists office, IRTs, staff planning, and then the staff lounge. And you can see examples uh, here of these spaces with the old furniture and the before pictures. And this is typically what it should look like um, when it's all said and done. Um, I doubt we're going to sit all students that close together for very long. Maybe we'll space them out some. Who knows? Behavior might d determine some of that as well. I don't know. Um, <laughs> and you can see the teacher's desk with the, with the rolling side table and then the flexible seating in the bottom right-hand corner um, also are included. And then, of course, the, the kidney-shaped, I guess it's not really kidney-shaped anymore, semicircle half circle in the back um, for reading groups or so you know, so any, any other kind of guided, guided lessons. Um, and this is what the art room, this is the Oakville typical furniture at Oakville Elementary School, um, art and staff lounge. Uh, we're going to provide furniture for the following areas at Greenview Knowles Elementary School. Uh, there are 425 student chairs. Here's the breakdown of where those chairs go. The interesting component about these chairs, as you can see from the diagram on the side, they do pan and tilt side to side, front to back. So, um, you know, it's, it's ergonomical seating. And of course, uh, the manufacturer would have you know that students who sit in proper ergonomic positioning uh, have better physical reactions, such as reduction in wrist cramping, back pain, and heart rate, as well as lower blood pressure. Sitting in the proper angle reduces eye strain and fatigue which in turn reduces the occurrence of headaches, which I think we all know from sitting for long periods of time. That's true. That's true. Before you move on from that slide, may I ask a question? Sure. Um, it occurs to me that um, with a, a chair that has so much moving capability, it also has a lot of breakage capability. Um, what warranties are available for these chairs? Is this a reasonable thing for us to do? Um, are we going to wind up um, having a lot of broken chairs from kids who decide that, you know, they got to yep, yep. gotta move? So I, I asked that very question when I was asked to do this presentation, and um, Ms. Laino did do research in the background to find out who had them and the durability of the product, and they said that they've had no problems whatsoever. Because my, my, my thought process was exactly the same. A lot more moving parts, a lot more things to break. Um, 
but says that was assured that no, and that there was uh, there's a one year warranty on the whole chair, and then there's it extends 12 years um, on some of the parts with the chairs. Okay. So it's um, yeah. Okay. Based on that research. I, I appreciate that. Yep, sure. Uh, so Duran Incorporated, uh, Mid-Atlantic Furniture Dealership, 52 years service, servicing Maryland, Delaware, and Virginia. Uh, we've used them quite a bit. Um, again, reiterating the proposals. Um, they offer discounts on selected manufacturers' list prices. Their price does include installation. Uh, we can take delivery in eight weeks, and there is a warranty, a minimum uh, limited one-year warranty. And we're uh, using purchase contract from the Mid-Atlantic Purchasing Team uh, issued by Howard County, Maryland um, in the category of furniture uh, and equipment. Contract period from January 1st, 23 to December 31st, 23. And there is a two-year renewal option remaining on that contract. So with that, I ask that the Board of Education approve this agenda item as presented. Questions? I have no questions at this time. Thank you. Um, it's clearly you have a lot of furniture that's uh, damaged or uh, lived out its useful life. I just was curious if you looked at maybe cherry picking and taking out uh, defective equipment and keeping the functional equipment. Because of the age of these, what we will do is anything that is sal salvageable and that can be used in other locations where they have, you know, places in their building that are in worse condition than some of our better condition uh, equipment. We will store that and then we do have a system where people can inquire about furniture that we have stored at DSS that they can make use of in their own location. So we won't just get rid of everything. We will hand pick what's salvageable that we can maybe use at another site or keep at that school in, in some cases. So you're not getting, you're getting your full life cycle out of these you're saying some of the furniture has been around since the 60s or yeah some of the original furniture would date back to the original the original construction of the building and then of course anytime you add you know classrooms where you do an addition you have to then acquire more furniture so some of that could have been acquired brand new some of that would have been acquired from something that we had stored so once you have that many additions you have a variety of furniture from a variety of different places in a variety of conditions Thank you. Sorry. So my question is, um, with children that are more fidgety, do you have you heard anything that this might help them be a little bit more relaxed? Well, this type. So of anybody that's taught in a classroom who's put who's put um, things into place for those kids, like you've seen, like chairs will have bands bands at the bottom of the legs so that those kids that have to keep moving have some resistance and you'll see uh, you know you see students sitting on balls in classrooms uh, there's all kinds of things that we do for for students like that this will absolutely uh, aid and help for students like that now you know the flip side is well is it going to be an avenue you know for other kids maybe and that might be a classroom management piece uh, going forward um, but if they're quiet and they're moving and they're not disturbing I see this as a win really for for everybody Thank you. Mary. No questions. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. You already answered the question I had, so thank you very thank much. You. I appreciate it. Thank you. Okay. May I have a motion? I move that the Board of Education approve the consent agenda as presented for the contract for installation. Oops. Sorry. I'm on the wrong one. Um, right here. Okay. I thought it was a little short. <laughs> I move that the Board of Education approve the contract award for Duran Incorporated in the amount of $277,018.37 for Oakville Elementary School and the amount of $65,126.75 for Greenview Knowles Elementary School totaling $342,145.12. To provide delivery and installation and install classroom and administrative office furnishings at Oakville Elementary School and student chairs at Greenview Knowles Elementary School. I have a second. second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Motion is carried. Thank you. Thank you.
Okay, we have Miss Hunt with a Naviance presentation. Computer's not being friendly. Okay, I guess play nice, please. Okay. New presentation is. Good morning. Good morning. So I'm here this morning with Miss Corinne Marino, who is the department chair at Leonardtown High School. And she's going to be the boots on the ground, answering questions, and also just helping to really fully develop how our students interact with Naviance as a platform. So Naviance, you should know, uh, we have a nationally recognized college and career platform um, and I think it was as of three years ago the last time I checked um, pretty much every district in the state of Maryland except for about five use an aviance because of its reputation um, so what is an aviance? An aviance is a comprehensive grade 6 through 12 college and career readiness platform that really helps students to connect their personal interests, uh, their knowledge of themselves, their strengths, to post-secondary planning. It is a process, and it's meant to be a deliberate building of skills from grade six to 12, because that's what uh, career development is all about in college career awareness. It involves self-discovery, it involves career exploration, and then it leads to thoughtful secondary planning. When we look at um, Naviance, we have it set up to be a series of sco a scope and sequence series, series. So in grade six, students are gaining a better understanding of their learning style and how to apply that in school because we want to prepare them to be lifelong learners. So this is a part of this process. In grade seven, they learn about career clusters and identify clusters of interest. So one of the aspects when you're talking about career development, you're talking, you, we have to teach children how to view the world of work. And that's pretty expansive. So we began with a process. We chunk, the uh, world of work is chunked into clusters of careers and they explore the cluster and then they will begin to narrow that focus into specific jobs. In grade eight, we de deepen their knowledge about their personality and how it relates to specific careers. And we actually use the Holland Code theory and approach to career exploration and we'll go into that when I begin to demonstrate some of the platform. In grade nine, they're exploring careers that now match their interest. <coughs> and uh, in grade 10, they're going to gain a better understanding of their strengths and how to use their strengths to accomplish goals. So it's about developing the student as they're also exploring the world of work. In grade 11, they're going to then focus um, more toward post-secondary planning in terms of exploring their colleges, exploring trades uh, that might match their career interests. And then in grade 12, there is a, there is the, a culmination of finalizing their resume, searching for scholarships, and completing the college application process. Now, the scope and sequence is a journey um, that students began. And this journey really is about, who am I? So Naviance has several discovery tools that touch upon the student understanding and reflecting about themselves, how they learn best in grade six, what their personality is like in terms of their primary traits and how that would interact with possible future careers, their strengths, as an individual in terms of we always want people to be able to choose careers and, and pathways that complement and are in, uh, conducive to their strengths. 
what do I want to do? This is the next section in how do I take my self-knowledge that I've gained and how do I apply that in a workforce setting? So in grade seven, they're exploring their uh, career cluster finder. In grade nine, they're conducting a uh, personal interest, interest inventory. And then the final question on this journey is how do I get there? And we have the tools, uh, college and trade school super match. This is something I'll demonstrate today. And then in grade 12, the EDOCS, which is the college application process uh, and handling of documentation and also resume builder. There are additional research tools uh, with embedded within Naviance. One is the advanced college search tool, which is great for students in their uh, junior and uh, senior year as they're trying to now navigate how do I research uh, national schools. This is a big undertaking. So we try to model what, how they might approach this. So the advanced college search allows them to identify specific criteria and then offers up schools that may match with that criteria. College lookup, they, students can look up college directly and compare colleges. College events are uh, also posted in Naviance so they can look for when there's going to, when they can sign up for a tour, when there's a uh, specific event that's occurring, if there's FAFSA events, if they're going to have college rep visits within their own high school. These are events that can be looked at. Work-based learning. Now that presents a particular challenge which I'm glad to see we're going to be, uh, I think, um, providing a solution to this. What is work-based um, learning? This is for students that are still in high school but are desiring to go straight into the workforce from uh, high school. Work-based learning is where you would go and within your own community, explore the types of internships that might be available, explore opportunities within companies for apprenticeships, uh, and search for those within your own community. Now, the difficulty that we have with this is we did not have the manpower uh, within the school system to really develop this out. We had certain pathways of communication, such as STEM students had a pathway of communication with the base and learning the types of internships that might be available uh, for them, but we want our Choptecon students, our Leonardtown High School students, students that are, may not be in a particular program to also have access and knowledge of internships. And additionally, access and knowledge of job opportunities. What this work-based learning um, feature will do, once we're able to build this out, is provide students the opportunity to not just look for an available job, but then to take the knowledge that they've been learning about themselves from 6th to 12th grade, take their interest, and begin to look for a job where there is a close match in this. So with the blueprint and the MOU that we'll be entering with the local workforce management board, I believe we're going to have the staff that will help us develop out this feature in Naviance. So I'm very excited about providing um, even more uh, information available at the fingerprints, uh, at, the, at the touch of the students to explore for themselves as well as parents. So let's go into um, demonstration on a few of the features. Really for a full demonstration on Naviance you need a good hour. Okay. Looks good. 
Yeah, that's good. Okay. So I'm demo, um, going to, I've gone in and created a fake account for myself so that we can see um, the pieces here. And I'm going to go into sixth grade, learning and productivity. And I'll just touch on these unless you have specific questions, please do stop me. Um, with self-discovery, and we go into learning and productivity, which is one of the activities that they do in um, sixth grade. They'll answer a series of questions about how they learn best or where they're most comfortable. And then as a result of these series of questions, they will have a report that comes back to the student um, about their sensory preferences. You know, do they uh, need to have uh, a lot of high visual pieces to be able to learn? Do they need to uh, have kinetic uh, engagement in order to learn or auditory distractions? So you can see they began to get a report on their learning style, what works best for them to absorb inf information. It's also mindsets, whether they need more structure, less structure. Um, and we'll just come through on down. They will also make recommendations based upon what the student is reporting in terms of their learning style they'll make a recommendation on what that student can do if they're working on independent tasks or if they have homework that they need to do or long-term assignments they'll make recommendations on where the student is going to be able to perform best what has been interesting to watch is when our school counselors are going in and doing this particular assessment uh, with students um, we've had some of our sixth grade teachers um, ask, can I get a hold of that report? Because this provides a lot of information for that teacher to be able to connect with a particular student, to look at how that student learns best and uh, help guide the teacher in providing instruction or working with the student in a manner that um, they're going to be able to get the best success from the student. So, and it's a lengthy report with various recommendations because we want to be aware of how we learn best because that's going to drive how we set ourselves up in the future to be lifelong learners. In terms of um, seventh grade, it's a career cluster finder and with the career cluster finder, they're basically going in answering questions, they could be um, researching different careers, and you'll see here based upon questions that I uh, answered, I had several different clusters that were recommended to me, hospitality and tourism, and uh, I could click into this cluster and now I'm going to be exploring different careers or jobs that would be in that particular cluster. Um, and I'm going to come back to later on the thought of employee outlook, employment outlook related occupations. So they're taking that first venture into how to understand the world of work. When we move into eighth grade personality, this gets interesting because they touch upon the Holland's code a theory about career choice, career satisfaction, and Holland's uh, six personality traits. The students take a, a survey uh, to determine their primary personality traits. And the thought behind this is if you can better wed an educational experience and also your career choices, if they are reflective of your natural personality, you're more likely to be successful in those choices and you're more likely to experience a long-term satisfaction in that particular career. So students then began to learn about their personality traits. Are they an introvert, an extrovert? Are they more thinking or more feeling? Um, these are the types of um, traits that you see here. It'll go into a long-term um, elaborate explanation of those traits it uh, will talk about in the results um, how it's a, a particular trait is a strength to them in terms of learning, where things might be a challenge for them, recommendation on learning activities. 
But in the end, at the close of this report, I'm sorry, I, I don't mean to make you guys sick with spinning so quickly. I just don't want to take up too much time. We then began to see careers that are suggested that would naturally be an expression of those personality traits, a nice fit for students to explore. So now they're really thinking in terms of the world of work, who am I, what are my interests, and what will I do well in? Um, and you can see it provides them with the education that might need to, they need to explore, the medium salary. We want them favoriting different careers as they go through this developmental phase from 6th to 12th grade, uh, and then narrowing those choices. This provides them the opportunity to reflect back. And if I were to click on any of this printing press operator, it's going to take me to information on what they do and also salaries across the U.S. And I'm going to go further into that in ninth grade. So let's go into ninth grade where they will do the career interest profiler. Now here you'll see the aspect of where we want to layer and build skill and knowledge because this is a journey. Um, so you're going to see that the students will once again be reminded of, hey, these were some of your strong personality traits. Um, and then they're going to provide them with once again, sorry, spinning again, with different careers that would match that personality trait. Let's go into one, education and child care. Let's click on that. Everyone. Yeah, so we can see at a glance, they're going to talk to us a little bit about well, what is this. They'll see, well, it will require a four-year college, your median national salary. Um, and let me go down here just a bit. Not only do we, we can get salaries in South Carolina, Don't go there. North Carolina, <laughs> George, Florida, and there's Maryland. So they can even look across the U.S. of where the medium salary is currently. Not only that, they'll have information on, well, what does this person do? And if we go into the cluster itself, we can see related pathways. Because now we're at a point where we need to begin to look at, well, how do I get there? Because that's also that third prong question. So if I tap on administrative, oh, so we're looking at this. We can look at upcoming events that might be available at particular in our high school. Is there going to be a career fair? Is there something on FAFSA? We can look at employment outlook. And what do they tell us about teachers? What's our future opportunity? Will this job be around in 10 years? And how much of an opportunity am I going to be able to get employment? And it's interesting that it says a number of older teachers are expected to reach retirement age through 2024. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it talks about related occupations because we're still exploring areas of interest. And then related majors because now we're going to start looking about do I want to go to college? So it'll provide us different majors and what those majors might look like. And a plan of study. Now, this plan of study is going to be fairly generic, but it's going to recommend to students who are sitting in ninth grade, hey, you have three years to look at. So um, do you guys ever look at this, Mrs. Marino? So what we do is we do these presentations before we do registrations with our students in our building. So when we go into the ninth grade classroom, we did it in January knowing that we were registering with our students in March. So we talked to them about like, what did it come up with? These are the classes that you could uh, offer next year in our school building. The Tech Center application is open in, in January, it closes in February. So the, we, we time it so that we can have those opening discussions about their pathway and about their opportunities that they have uh, in our comprehensive high school as well as the Tech Center. Why are you waiting till ninth grade? Why aren't they doing this in eighth grade as they're selecting their classes for their freshman year? So they, they do go in eighth grade with the counselor. Um, and remember, we talked about in eighth grade, you're looking at the personality right. traits. 
introduction to it. You're looking at career clusters in eighth grade. They will talk about high school, eighth grade counselors, mm -hmm. uh, talk about this, the pathways that are available in high school and some of the basic courses. But it's really the ninth grade that you're going to begin the fine tuning of those pathways. Because you can't go into the fourth set. Well, you can speak to this more. So, so I don't know what the eighth grade counselors do. I know what, what we do in the high school. So, okay, so oh. here's here's well, just a second. So here's here's my yeah. here's my concern. Sure. Right. So we have we have eighth grade students mm -hmm. who are looking at classes for their ninth grade year. Mm -hmm. Okay. So starting your ninth grade year, my impression would be that you would have some idea whether you are going to attend a four year college, go to a trade school, go right after work. Right. So I. From what I've seen, as I, there's some disconnect between our eighth grade counselors and our ninth grade and our high school counselors as to what what that bridge is. Because when, once you get to ninth grade, you should, if you're on a college track, you should already have a bank of classes that are going to put you on that college track. Correct? Um. Yeah. So, so I, I definitely agree. Um, I think the transition could probably be a little bit smoother. Um, just in terms of like registering for your high school classes um, in eighth grade But um, I think a lot of that comes from the fact that in ninth grade um, most of what you're taking is predetermined um, like you have to take um, your English, you know, math, standard science, standard social studies, English. fine arts, yeah. PE, health, and right. then you exactly. might have a little right. bit of and and your math is predetermined by what your math by is in eighth grade. In eighth your grade. English is predetermined. The social studies is just U.S. history. I mean, the the. But, but but my thinking is, if with the blueprint, don't they have to know by tenth grade? Correct. Mm -hmm. right. so, um, well, I mean, so yeah. how this all backs into the blueprint? Right. Yeah. Is that that's my. That's my we, you know, right. We got we got a tenth grade now. Yeah, not to abbreviate the presentation, which is fantastic, and I think everybody this is it's it's so important for people who don't have children in the school system, Correct. who make a whole bunch of sweeping statements that that the school systems aren't doing this. They need to do this. We need to do this. We need to do this. It's important that you understand the tools that children are exposed to and the plan six through 12 to help them navigate post-secondarily to the most successful next stage in their life. So everybody needs to understand that we are, we are building all of this. Now, the blueprint is going to bring more money into the system and specifically the $62 per child for the next three years, a million dollars that we are to be spending on career counseling per se, this is going to be an investment in Naviance, in personnel to help coordinate so that it isn't just the counselors who are going in and doing presentation too, because Ms. Marino, you have how many students? You, you on have, my caseload. Uh, your caseload. Over 2,000 in our building. 2,000 in the building, over 400 on your caseload, right? So <coughs> any addition to kind of help kids navigate through this and also to work with our teachers to make sure that they are incorporating this into their, into their classroom, into their coursework, and making sure that every parent knows that they can sit down with their child and say, hey, let's go to Clever and pull up your Naviance account and let's take a look at what's in there. Because if you haven't done that with your child, you're missing out on a lot of very valuable information that they're sharing with the school system and that ultimately we are using to direct them through their right. time. Right. right. Well, that's my next point. Like, so where, where's the parent involvement? Like, because, like, I mean, I, I mean, I'm assuming I can log in as a parent, right? If I go to Naviance, I, it can say, but yet I don't, I need an access code. I need, I need help in order to set that up. Right. Well, well, so just so we are now relying on sixth, seventh, and eighth graders to actually communicate with their parents about what they did in school that day. So you know, I just we just, I think I, I, we just need to close the loop some in some. The largest places. challenge is a parent has to talk to their child mm -hmm. and say, "Hey, let's log into Naviance." Right. Well, I mean, like I I know I, what, I know what my right. I mean, I know what my son came up with right, right on on mm -hmm. his eighth grade whatever yes. his. Mm -hmm test or whatever it was set, yeah. right yeah so but but what I'm saying is if but this is not for this is for it's, I understand it's, I understand it's for kids but I mean you know we've had the discussion with several you know outside organizations within the county about engaging parents in order to make sure that they yes. understand what their what their child's opportunities are right yes. 
So at the same time, we have this great tool, but we need to just do a little bit better communicating with the parents that mm -hmm. it's out there because yes. I don't necessarily see it in my smore. I don't necessarily, you know, see it in my communications with my son's guidance counselor, right? I mean, so that, you know, it's just, I think there just needs to be a little bit more, not that you're not doing it, it's just. The, the good news you know. is the blueprint is going to invest about a million dollars a year for the next three years, and the whole focus of that investment is going to be making sure that everybody understands the power of the tool Naviance and how it's used. But we're never going to get any further than the student themselves and then the parents. Right. And if the parent isn't asking the child to show them what's in Naviance, that's going to be the fatal flaw in the plan. And if the child does not take seriously the uh, inter interest inventories and the assessments right. and they just basically play clicky clicky right then they're going to get then it's not going right. to be a Garbage very right. right it's not going to be a very useful tool but that's also okay wait i'm going to save this for at the end of your presentation okay, okay. I, yeah here i'll save this right. but i mean we could just yeah. abbreviate and say like look there's a lot of stuff in here and it's <laughs> everything that everybody tells us we need to be doing is in this platform and accessible to all of our secondary school <clears throat> students. They all have logons and we have in place a presentation for every single grade level coordinated by our counselors for every single student. Now, some may take that very seriously and use it to its greatest advantage. Some may take it about this and use it very effectively in their senior year when they're looking at digital transcripts to send to colleges and gathering <laughs> reference letters from teachers. Mm -hmm. And then there'll be some that just kind of don't really engage with it at all, and that's where our work needs to be. But that work isn't going to be done, that work has to be done one-on-one-on-one-on-one -on -one -on -one -on -one and engage directly with the students and the parents. Mm -hmm. And we, we do want to keep in mind, this is developmental. And we never want to close the college doors on a student starting in ninth grade. We want to hold those open because there's a lot of maturity that happens in those high school years. Um, final feature that I'll demonstrate to you, and this is college search because that can be a huge endeavor for students. And so there is an instrument where they can go in and say, I really like a rural college. I want to be smack in the city. Give me something huge. Give me something small. I need a college that has um, horses. I need a college that has, so you can put all these features in that are important to you. And Naviance will do a, a search and then recommend certain colleges to you that match those features and give you how, what the percentage of the match is and also your academic match. You can also, let me just go quickly into this, research colleges directly um, and let's see, I said I'm going to, wait a minute, I'm going to colleges that I have favored that I'm thinking about. Let me just go into John Hopkins here. And from the One Naviance site, I get information about John Hopkins. I get the overview. I can go into what studies they offer. I can go into what their student life is like, ethnicity, gender, age, international students. I can go into a virtual tour of John Hopkins. Um, or I can apply online right from Naviance. I can also do a research on uh, cost or admissions. What's the application fee, acceptance rates, does that I can tell you what the on-time four-year graduation rate is? Yes, that's also important. Um, I think that's under, eh, is that overview? Yes, so graduation rate, 89% uh, graduate, which is very good. And this is an important figure to look at. I need to stop talking. You need to talk more. That's okay, fine. That she lives this with her students. Anything else you want to? No, I, I love Naviance and the fact that um, it really helps students too with scholarships um, in the fact that if a school emails me because I'm a designated school counselor for Leonardtown High School, if Morgan State or some school emails us and says we have this scholarship available for students who are majoring in this, 
we can actually run reports to pull up the name of the students that Leonardtown High High students have applied to, reach out to them individually and say, if you're interested in attending this school, this opportunity exists, feel free to look at it. There's just, there is a lot of components. Um, and, and we're lucky to have Jennifer Wilson in our building as our college career liaison because um, I just send her something and she magically happens and mm -hmm. does it. Um, so that's really helpful, but she does a lot of emails to parents in our building. Mm -hmm. I know middle schools don't have those people. Um, so I, I think because we probably do have more resources at the high school, maybe the information is a, a little bit more accessible um, in our building than maybe middle schools don't have. But hopefully with the blueprint. Does but you do need to know, we run completion reports at the end of the year yep. so that I know which students have completed the task for that year. The school counselors know, and they will go back and re-scoop the, the student that wasn't there, pull them in small groups, that type of thing. So the, the middle school, uh, they're, they're receiving this as well. Mm -hmm. And you can see, uh, you can search for scholarships that Ms. Marino spoke to, national scholarships and local scholarships. Do you have data on what percentage of students go to Naviance? And what is the success rate of the students going there? Um, so I have data on the students that are accessing Naviance, uh, the percentages of that, and uh, those that have completed their required piece. Yep. There's data that you can see how many students are tap, uh, the number of times students are tapping into Naviance. Right now as a district, we just ensure that they're meeting the graduation requirement, which is completing their uh, assigned sequence and task for that school year. Um, we can glean from Naviance the schools, the four-year universities and two-year universities that they're applying to how many apply to it, the students that apply to it. Um, there's quite a bit of um, data. We also have data as how our students, through Naviance, how they're doing um, the first two years of college. How many are completing college on time? Now, COVID messed that up a bit. Uh, in tracking this data, we could see, wow, it dropped. But now we're beginning to see it become more on track. So what percentage of our students are utilizing Naviance on a yearly basis, uh, you know, in the year that they're supposed to, what's the percentage? The, I don't have the percentage with me here today. I can tell you in terms of high school, uh, the number of students that need to be scooped up uh, at each high school at each grade level. Um, so I guess that would, if I had worked it out percentage wise, so the point being, I know specific names of students that still need to go in and complete their task. Uh, and for counselors to rescoop that. So it's not so much of an option of where they, they can or they have to. They have so we, to. we get pretty close to that 100% by the end of the year for yeah. all grade right. levels every right. year. Right, because Naviance interfaces with Common App, correct? Like, I mean, you can, like, you can, you can, so if you do a Common App, you can, you can feed Link your it. stuff from Naviance mm -hmm. into the Common App. Mm -hmm. Yes. So I would say any student in 11th or 12th grade who is planning to attend a four-year college is using it because you they really have, have no choice. Okay. Right? Well, you, you well have we have, to. we have data right. on everybody. So like every single right. kid has right. a Naviance login and every single right. child at the high school level has to complete yeah. the series of tasks because right. it's the graduation requirement as put forward by the Maryland State Department of Education to have their career portfolio. I, I think so I, it's a hundred percent but is that a meaningful hundred percent where people are deeply exploring and planning for their post-secondary success utilizing all of the facets of that very deep platform no and we know that because we went out and talked to kids and kids say yeah I got a presentation and I mean I went in and I clickety 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 and then I'm done um, you know, it's again, it's only it's only as valuable as how it's being used by the individual student, and it's the responsibility of the student and the parent, because eventually your child will graduate from St. Mary's County Public Schools, and then it's on you as to what they do next. And this is a great tool to set them up for success. And even after graduating, it's, they can continue to use open. Naviance. The platform stays open to search for colleges, because we want the door open. Mm -hmm. They just have to change their email. Yes. To yes. Personally to their new email because they can't right yeah. they no longer will access their SMCPS email yeah. it's, I, I think my point is 
um, we're spending a lot of money on this. It has a lot of potential. Yeah. Mm -hmm. As a board, I think we need to understand is that potential, how, how well is that potential being utilized? Mm -hmm. um, and are there any things that we're, we should be doing that we're not um, that would increase the usage of this? So and, and if you look to the blueprint, that we the plan that we just uploaded and approved and we're waiting for feedback from the state it outlines exactly how we are going to you have been using and will continue to use and expand the use and efficacy of Naviance that is the that is the blueprint mm -hmm. and Mrs. Adams to speak to that point um, I definitely think there are things that we could be um, doing a little bit better all, all with our kids yeah. um, to address this because um, as a student at Leonardtown High School, I'm sorry, no, I've been waiting to say that. But anyway, um, uh, like LHS has a very comprehensive like like system for this whole um, career counseling thing because Miss Wilson is great and she does send out scholarships like every week and I'm pretty sure the parents get those emails as well. Um, so like, but that just exists at like our high school. Like I don't know what the system is at Great Mills or at Chopticon or at any of the Similar. middle schools. Absolutely. And additionally, like I think a really important part of this um, that we haven't quite touched on today that um, like we've talked a lot about how it's like the responsibility of the student and um, the parent to make sure they're on top of that. But the student experience in 11th grade, particularly, I'm sure Lily knows this right now, um, 11th grade, 12th grade, honestly, is like oh, everyone's telling you to do things and like figure it out, but like you're freaking out because you don't know what to do. And so like it's oftentimes just like a I don't know where to research and nobody's like shoving Naviance in your face so you don't like think about that you're just like going on Google right. and you're like oh my god that's like completely unreliable and then you go on the college's website and you're like that's completely unreliable and you're like but what huh? so it's just a really scary like period so I think the like stress of um, like that experience is kind of what might be detracting from kids being able to fully use Naviance to its like full um, potential because it's a really great program but I don't think it is used by high school students as much as it could be um, like I did not use Naviance to do any of my college research I'm gonna be so like completely honest I didn't use it to do any of my college research and I probably should have but it's just because like, first of all, I mean, I this is a weird situation. Like, I went, 10th grade was just completely virtual for me. 11th grade was, like, weird. So the last time I touched Naviance before senior year was 9th grade. Mm -hmm. It was 9th grade when the counselors came into our, cl our English class and talked about it for a little bit. That was all I got Naviance was in high school. So, like, that, from there to this year when I had to um, like request transcripts and request recommendation letters and everything, there was no Naviance in my high school experience. And a lot of that was just because we weren't in the building or anything, but also a lot of that is because um, sometimes we just don't address the fact that like no, like no one tells high school juniors that like everything's gonna be okay, but sometimes they just need that and then pairing that everything will be okay because we have this reason that would be pretty that would be a pretty cool like you know like pairing of information you know because it would just make it would be like a reassurance so this, so this year's freshman class the class of 2026 mm -hmm. is going to be the first class that had this starting in seventh grade or whatever I mean well I mean because they did they did the test like they're the first class that have had, mm -hmm. well, have had it the whole way through middle school COVID. and right the whole way yeah. through. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So that might detract from some of it. That, but that's kind of like my, my, quite, like how much are they really touching it in exactly. middle school in order to get familiar with it? Because mm -hmm. she's exactly right. Like once you get to once you get to your junior year and everyone's like, oh my god, do this and do this and do this and do this, and you're like, what? Mm -hmm. So yeah, do what? Like, right. Exactly. <laughs> so. It, and I'm not saying it's not being done. I'm just saying that, you know, the more the kids touch it in middle school, then the easier it becomes for them to navigate it. You, if you start with a sixth grader and say, you really need to think about what you want to right, do as you become an adult. Right, exactly. And then you show a, a very right. appropriately sequenced platform where you do a little bit each year and it builds and builds and builds and everybody does it consistently. And we don't have a right. pandemic. Right. We don't have interruption of all of this. Mm -hmm. Right. 
what I'm saying is this is a good tool. We have a very no, good I, plan. I, right, I completely agree Our with blueprint that. Our blueprint is that we will be placing, we will be hiring, we're going to give money to the Workforce Development Board, and they're going to give it back, and we're going to hire for every single secondary school, every single middle school, and every single high school an additional staff person who is a full-time employee, very similar to what we have with our, our, our um, career navigators at, at each one of the high schools. We're going to have that. We're not taking that position away. We're including that position as well. There are going to be people in each one of the schools that this is, this is, their, whole, this is their whole deal. Mm -hmm. and, and so they constantly are working with kids, the program, the process, and teachers to say, teachers, maybe if you, you know, you're looking to an end of, this is a way that you could push this into your classroom, because everybody's one to one. You know, if you have a downtime, if you have homeroom, we were talking to the middle school kids and they every single, they have a homeroom of 15 minutes every day where they're just, where they're homerooming, but we don't necessarily know what's going on. It's unstructured time. That could be Naviance <laughs> time every single day. Like there's all of, there's a lot of opportunity yeah. and, to use this. Yeah, and kind of what I was saying is just like more like messaging focused because in 11th grade, all of a sudden everything becomes very real and everyone's telling you, oh, this matters now. But for the like five years before that, if you had already just assumed it was mattering, maybe it would be a little bit less stressful um, in that period. I was fortunate to like, like everyone was always telling me this mattered and in my life, so that was like, I was fortunate in that regard. So I wasn't as stressed about it. But I, I, I've seen a, many, like a large number of my peers just like, they were shocked like in 11th grade because we weren't, um, I don't know, it just, nothing felt real, like after high school did not feel real until 11th grade. And so I think the whole idea of starting it in sixth grade is a really great idea. Um, and I think if we just make it clear to students that one, they are doing a great thing by getting started early, and two, that it does matter, like now, it does matter now what you do now, will impact your future like if that is just clear from the beginning i think it'll just all work a lot better so yeah i i'm not again none of this is criticism for my part i love naviance i just didn't use it very much and maybe maybe what we do in a supplemental presentation because we you know we're talking a lot about college right but then you have the work-based learning mm -hmm. and so i think we need another one simply about what are we going to do for those kids that are going to enter the workforce right because like my like I mean, you know, when, when we're connecting them with real life meaningful work experiences, is that actually we have companies that are within this Southern Maryland area that are, you know, placing content on Naviance like the colleges are, you know, in order to, you know, expose people, you know, our students to other things like that. I know that's all part of the build out, but I think that's where we need to come back to, especially since we're on that blueprint mm -hmm. deadline of mm -hmm. 10th grade. Yeah. So some of that will occur more so as we do the build out right. with the workforce um, and blueprint. And hopefully, as our counselors always hold their spring junior presentation on Naviance about what they need to do to be able to search for colleges and apply. And hopefully, as they go into those senior class years, the students realize that they're actually working in Naviance. And hopefully, parents will attend the, pre the night presentations that the schools offer. So these are all opportunities that are out there, but we can only offer the opportunity. We, we can't take Good. it beyond that. We can compel everybody to complete the requirements of the career portfolio as set forward <laughs> by the Maryland State Department of Education through COMAR. Um, absolutely, but, but you know how well you use that tool to plan your future, that's, that is... You know that 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 that's a that's a relationship that a that the a parent has with their child, because the one thing I know is that come the first <laughs> week of June when you walk across the stage and I shake your Scott's hand, <laughs> we're, you, we're, you know we've done well, yeah I mean oh, it's that, from from up, that uh, point uh, forward <laughs> no one you know that it, it's it's great to have a, a, a fantastic tool that you've built out so you can have all this information, but if you're a if you are Googling information about careers and colleges in a high school in St. Mary's County Public Schools and you're not doing it through Naviance, you are you're you're not using the tool we're paying for. And you're not gonna get the data that's really probably gonna be the most helpful to you. No, yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm just saying like it's like sometimes that like the one like just the one time in a year isn't enough to like 
like really get it through like a ninth grader's head that yes, they it, need to be using this platform because this is more reliable voice. information. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no offense. <laughs> That's funny. Yeah. But um, yeah, just like, I don't know. I think yeah. if it's just more ingrained into mm-hmm. like the typical like average like high school experience in SMCPS and not something that's outstanding. If we could just in some way TikTok it. Because you'll spend four hours on TikTok. Right. But like Naviance, no, I can't not. Well, but but the same thing too. I think until until we expanded it, I think Naviance was always like, you know, in the public's mind, oh, it's like what you do to apply for college. Right? Yeah. It's, it's mm-hmm. like what you need to do to apply for college. So for those parents who have students that aren't going to go to college, they're like, well, you know, why are we doing this? Mm-hmm. So, you know, there's – because honestly, I mean, within – that that's really what it's been used for, you know, for our high school students that everyone talks about, mm-hmm. you know. Mm-hmm. So Yeah, because there's so much, like – there's so much more workforce, like, right. information on there. Right. I, it's just that – why does it matter to me piece is like the big piece that I think we just have to get through to mm-hmm. our high school communities and that includes students and parents and all of the yep. above, but yeah. That'd be a great thing for Slack next year. I'm just saying. Future, future, <laughs> future student member of the board. So the eighth graders will be the first group that have actually used it from sixth, seventh and eighth going into high school, you said? Well, the, the, the challenge the is we, we, the, we rolled it down into sixth grade. And then COVID hit. In the pandemic. Right. So like oh, all the kids, oh, so right. when we talked to the middle so school kids, the eighth, eighth grade. grade. Yeah. Right, so, so this year's yes. right, right, so yeah. okay, so right. so this year been any students. Well, they haven't they, really. They've done it, but this year's freshman class is the first ones that they did that, they did the, the, the tracking, I think, last year of what their, yeah. what their, what their and we talked to middle school kids. Right, they had, exactly. they knew what the, they knew what the button looked like. Right. Yes. Exactly. And they had gone <laughs> into it, and they might have done some work in it, but they didn't understand the context of this is the thing that helps you plan for and will carry up all the way through. And that's really what we heard from the students. It was just like the context piece was missing. Yeah. Like the why does it matter? Like they, they're mm-hmm. like, oh, we did this thing. It kind of took like one class period. And on they said one it should random be, Wednesday. You know, a, a, you know, a statistician or, you know, something. Exactly, like that. exactly. exactly. <laughs> and so they didn't understand, like, the gravity of, like, the poten- like the potential that that program has to, like, help you. So I think just making that more clear is just, like, because obviously it's a very self-guided program. Like, you do right. it, what you put in is what you get out of it. But, like, like, 11-year-olds need a little bit of encouragement to put their all into something. So, like, just like that, you know, that aspect of it. Yeah. That's, yeah. I, the only comment I have is, it, is uh, I kind of put myself, uh, what I went through when I was uh, in middle school and high school, we didn't have a program like this at all. Uh, when I was in high school and in college, I had uh, fellow students didn't know what they, what they wanted to do. You know they're in their first or second year uh, at college, and they, and I said, "What do you want to be?" I don't know. So I think the program you're do, that you're working on is wonderful. I just hope it works, and that uh, that we don't let some of the students fall through the cracks, and as as uh, Mrs. Bailey said about the work uh, work base uh, training. To me. I see that as very, very important, judging from what I've been reading in the papers lately about enrollments in colleges are dropping now. Mm-hmm. Uh, it costs so much money mm-hmm. to go through school and you get a degree uh, and you can't find a job or you can't find the job that you want. So uh, I, w- I would think this work- work-based uh, learning is really, really important part of your program. Um, I think the program is very good and and what has been said up here is we need to strengthen our communication piece so the parents will be aware of the program and that they go to the program with their children can they access this (laughs) and they need to uh, be aware of it I just think we need to do a better job of doing that because the program is excellent but is only as effective as people knowing about the program and how to use it. And we do need the parent involvement in the program with the student. That's key. 
because students are not gonna tell their parents what happened in school today, nothing, you know. So I think that's key. So we have to do a better job of that. And I'd like to see like a follow up afterwards to see the difference as yeah. the schools are coming into high school, how they are using it. That would just be an idea. And then the only thing that I kind of saw was the creativity students. I, I just don't see them adapting to this. There might be something. Oh, there's in a the deep thing. rich if you are right. interested if you're in. You're an entrepreneur. If you want to be an entrepreneur and you want to be self employed, because that's always the best. You're your own boss. Yeah. You, nobody has to tell you what to do. Right. You know, of course, you work. There's a, a, a feature but, um, called Road Trip Nation where they have. Um, huh? There's videos yeah. embedded on Yeah, the there's front. short videos, long videos of the top people who are at the top of their field, hundreds of fields across the nation internationally, and students click on these videos uh, in seventh grade. They do navigate and explore through Road Trip Nation. Uh, and some of these are artists, some of these are musicians, some of these are chemical engineers, some of these are construction workers. And construction yeah. workers, and they simply talk mm -hmm. about their pathway, they jour their journey, how they got there, what they like. So it's there. Mm -hmm. okay. okay. But I do agree with Dr. Smith that the more that we can embed Naviance in the classroom, the, classroom. Right. the more students will be right. using it. Mm -hmm. um, it's difficult to task counselors with 400 students that need to meet with the students and our increased mental health needs to right. also be in classrooms on an ongoing basis. So it is a competition for time and manpower and hopefully Blueprint will help aid and ease some of that. Yeah, we, and we can bring back statistics as to how it's being used, completion rates by grades, all of, all of that. We can, and with the blueprint, we are going to be bringing back a lot of reporting on this, and if we are gonna spend a million dollars a year and bring in eight new staff members, they would be the ones that will ultimately come forward and talk uh, pretty specifically about how they are uh, using this product and, and, and helping, kids, helping kids through. All right, the longest 10 minute presentation ever. <laughs> thank you so much. A great deal of information, yes. thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Okay, Naviance. I need to go back, I don't even know what my next job's gonna be. <laughs> All right, here's Doran. Well, if you try, you know, I need. Well, it said I was gonna be, a, I should be a party planner. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, yeah, because I plan a party every day. Mine was, I was either supposed to be a shop teacher or a dentist. Ooh. I was use a drill a regardless. <laughs> I was supposed to be an accountant. <laughs> you leaned right into it. I did. Very yeah, that's mm -hmm. actuarial. Right. Accountant is actually yeah. what they told me to be. Oh my gosh. <laughs> You're probably going to die. <laughs> Statistically, <laughs> doesn't look good for you past 67. Here, right? Oh, you can just click anywhere and it should go to the next slide. Yeah, okay. but you can there too. Good morning, everyone. Good, good morning. morning. Good morning. So I'm here to talk about our current farms data, and then um, Kim will follow with um, her, her updates as well. We've been doing these kind of together because they're so interrelated. I agree. Mm -hmm. Good plan. Okay, so um, first I'd like to talk about um, how kids qualify for farms, which is free and reduced school meals. There are many different categories. Um, one is our direct certification. Um, I did have an update to the presentation that told you what SNAP and TANF yeah. are. So SNAP is... Um, and that's what's posted to the... So anybody yeah, visiting board, board Docs is going to see it. We okay. just loaded it. Okay. Right. It's on Board Docs. Um, so that's our, our um, food stamps, our temporary... and uh, the. Uh, TANF is the temporary cash assistance. Um, then we have our homeless students, our migrant, our runaway, foster, and then this year we actually had Medicaid students which qualified uh, through direct certification, which was um, a significant increase to our uh, farms data. So the main impact this year was our Medicaid students. Um, household income is our second way that kids qualify um, for free and reduced meals. Um, that's below 130% of the federal poverty line. 
Um, so income between 130 and 185 percent um, apply for the reduced level. So this year currently Maryland is also picking up that reduced price. So reduced students are also essentially free um, to the meal program, but they still fall under that reduced category. Another program that we do is Maryland Meals for Achievement, which is our MMFA school breakfast in the classroom. Um, currently this year, uh, we have 11 schools, and next year, as you can see on the slides, uh, we will have a total of 14 schools that qualify. Banneker, Oakville, and uh, Esperanza will also qualify for Maryland Meals for Achievement. Um, we did, it is an application process. It's not a guarantee that those schools will get it if the funding is not available. But this current year we had um, Town Creek and, who, who joined us this year? Town Creek and, I think it was just Town Creek that joined us this year. Um, and we got the funding for that. So I don't see that we won't get funding for those schools next year, but it is a possibility that those schools might not be funded. Now our middle school and high schools can do um, grab and go breakfast, so they don't necessarily have to do the breakfast in the classroom, um, just because of the size and the number of homerooms that, that are in those buildings makes it very difficult to do that in classroom. Uh, so next year, the possibility of having um, about half of our students receiving um, breakfast in the classroom. So as you can see on these <coughs> slides, um, the percentage of increase. So currently um, we're at 40 percent um, and last year we were around 32 percent. So since I've been here, this is my seventh year, um, we've always sat around 31, 32 percent. So in, with those additions of our, those Medicaid uh, free and reduced students, uh, that has really jumped our percentage up to about 40 percent. Um, and as you can see, some of these schools uh, with significant increases in, in their farms populations. So this current school year, um, we are at 32%, and that was for our free students was 4,895, and our reduced was uh, around 600. Um, so the other, with the addition of the Medicaid students, were around 6,000 for free and almost 1,000 for reduced. Anyone have any questions or comments or anything you'd like Anyone? me to elaborate I have any on? Questions. Thank you. I think it's hard for the um, general population to understand um, that St. Mary's County, as wealthy as it seems, um, does have such a significant population of people living in poverty and the significant impact that has on um, the community as a whole. Um, I, I, um, I think our, our, I would I think that our um, commissioners would be very surprised by this, um, and uh, it, it speaks to the importance of why not only feeding these kids is so important, but um, the the depth and breadth of, of opportunities and um, supports that we have in place for students. Um, is is costly but it's more costly not to do anything so when well, as you can see um, typically our southern end of the county was the schools that uh, received the Maryland Meals for Achievement but as you can see the addition of Banneker Oakville and <coughs> excuse me Esperanza for next year that those that it, it, it's migrating up um, with well, Dinard has been in that uh, population for several years now but now like I said as you can see you know um, that the areas are, are starting to to increase with that because for Maryland Meals for Achievement it, it's 40 percent <clears throat> for those for those schools to qualify for that program. I was also struck by the the flip in um, Carver and Lexington Park yes um, in, in terms of their poverty mm -hmm. uh, because for the longest time Carver has been um, has has been about the highest of our um, population with, within poverty. Yeah, so the year before they were higher than um, Lexington Park, and this year Lexington Park really mm -hmm. has, has, has increased by 4% over Carver, which is, is surprising. Significant. Do you see the uh, increases uh, partially uh, caused by uh, the COVID uh, pandemic, I guess you call it, in the last couple of years? I, I think that that does, have, that does play a part, but I also feel that um, 
perhaps that they, it has always been there. The Medicaid students were not included uh, in our direct certification uh, prior to this school year. And we had a, around 1,000 students that qualified direct certification just through that Medicaid program. So um, to, it's hard to say um, if it's just pandemic related or if, it, it, if the need was all, always there, but those particular students didn't qualify before. Mm -hmm. And kind of with that, um, I also think that um, it's in a way like good that um, more students that are, are receiving um, free and reduced meals because um, I also think that there was probably a similar need in the past. It's just um, more students are um, being able to, you know, take advantage of those resources now, which is always the goal. But um, yeah, I definitely think this uh, data is staggering and would be um, very surprising to a lot of people in this county. I agree, Mrs. Allen. Okay, anything else? All right, thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Ms. Switch. Switch. Moves over into the next chair. <laughs> We move from mirroring to extended mm -hmm. to PowerPoint being already open. There we go. <laughs> so Megan and I did this presentation once before, and there's a direct correlation to the students and the families that we serve in how the housing is um, being proposed. And for a long time, um, our enrollment has been flat, and that's because there hasn't been a lot of growth. So residential development, especially during COVID, has had slowed down, but we're really starting to see an increase. So today I'm just gonna walk through some of the things that we're currently tracking um, that is being proposed within the county. Um, one of the things I wanted to kind of go over is there's different categories of housing within um, the comprehensive zoning ordinance and they have different path um, of how they get approved. So a minor subdivision is a property that's gonna be divided into one to seven lots. Um, major subdivisions are more than seven lots, and a farmstead is a division of property into uh, any number of lots, each of which contain 15 or more acres. You're gonna find that in our rural areas of the county. And then multifamily residential development are site plan requirements determined by the Director of Land Use and Growth Management, and these are gonna be our large scale um, developments that we've, we're going to talk about. So I do sit as a representative of the county's Technical Evaluation Committee. Um, it is run through the Department of Land Use and Growth Management. When they get in a proposal for a development, they send it out to all of the agencies, county, um, Department of Public Works, um, Soil Conservation, um, State Highway, a whole bunch of collective groups get together and we put in our comments. Um, from a school systems perspective, we do review, we monitor, and we track. Our major focus right now is uh, working with um, transportation to look at how bus stops will work and how road patterns will um, be impacted by our um, bus routes. There's two paths that once they go through the technical evaluation committee, two paths that they can take. A minor subdivision, as we talked about, is one to seven lots. The um, approvals um, required can happen very quickly and it is the planning director at Land Use and Growth Management's approval only that they need. So these can add up very quickly and they go through the process very fast. The lots, the major subdivision that are seven lots or more, can take years. Um, we can see something and not see it again for another 15, 20 years based on the market and the conditions. Um, and they do have to go before the planning commission and the, through the planning director um, and can take multiple steps through concept plans and um, moving through to their final approvals. They can go to public hearings. So these, while we can hear about them in, in the community, sometimes I think people hear that something's gonna happen and they think it's happening imminently. Um, if we look at Wildwood, how long it's taken Wildwood, Clark's Rest, and Leonard's Grant to build out. They, they can take multiple um, years to do. So currently what we're tracking right now um, are several projects within um, the county's jurisdiction and one within the town of Leonardtown. Um, the calculations that are here, which are the 0.476 of a student per lot, 
um, were generated a long time ago that are consistently used. Um, and then for APF, for the Adequate Public Facilities Standard that the county utilizes through the Land Use and Growth Management to determine, it's 107% of the state rate of capacity for elementary, 109% for middle school, and 116% for high school with the anticipation that we know we need to grow students before we are able to apply. The thing I constantly mention is that those percentages don't get us to where we need to be. So there's a balance between APF and getting schools. Um, we have to have 50% of that population in place, and then we have to have the other 50% by the time the building is completed. So we kind of get into a situation, we're gonna talk about this in this presentation, of we're gonna generate a certain number of students we're going to then potentially reach the capacity, but we won't have enough to generate a new need for a school. So it is something that we monitor. Um, I'm gonna go through these a little bit more in depth as we go through each one, but we do have First Colony, um, which received planning um, commission approval of their PUD amendment, um, which will generate another 119 students. Old Rolling, um, old rolling Road Apartments um, has 568 units. Um, the Planning Commission approved their comprehensive water and sewer plan um, back in May, which would generate 270 students. And this is a key piece in any development because if you don't have water and sewer, you can't build this density. Um, but it may be years before we see this actually come to fruition. Stewart's grant, PUD, um, on um, March 27th, the Planning Commission approved their minor PET amendment and it is up for their um, public hearing for their concept site plan on Monday night. Um, 1,122 units for an additional 534 students. The Villas at Lexwood is an additional 40 units and they have a concept site plan um, that was presented to the TEC back in October for an additional 19 students. Um, a final section in the woods at Myrtle Point, which is section three, which is 132 students and it did receive its major subdivision approval back in March of 2022 for an additional 63 students. Um, in addition, we're tracking the Meadows at Town Run 2, um, which is the extension of 303 um, additional units, which will receive concept of approval through the town in January of 2022 for a total of 2,415 um, potential new units, or 1,005 students in total. If you look at the breakout, it's an additional 454 elementary school students, 226 middle school students and 325 high school students. So we start talking about where they're located. I want you to think about what Ms. Doran said, which was the central portion of the county is starting to have a higher poverty level than it has in the past. It's spreading up. When you start talking about where these are, you're going to see a very large concentration on the middle portion of the county um, down to, to, to the Great Mills Road area. So the first colony pod did receive its um, planned unit development approval for 250 residential units, and that is located at the corner of um, Route 4 as you're turning into Target. Um, it's a very high density um, area. Um, these are not low income housing units. These are upper end. Um, we'll have residential. Be, it will be very nice um, in terms of the amenities that they're offering, but this is um, a higher end development. Um, Old Rolling Road um, is situated right behind the um, Best Buy Old Navy um, shopping center um, and they did get their comprehensive water and sewer um, plan amendment so there is water and sewer. This is 568 apartments and is currently um, more towards the workforce housing. Um, but again, if you're, you're talking just the other side, so First Colony, the one I just talked about, is on one side of the shopping center, this is on the other. Um, so really concentrating a very large amount of students um, potentially in a very close po proximity to one another. Um, Woods at Myrtle Point, um, again, off of Route 4, in the same vicinity. Um, they have a concept site plan for 132 townhomes. Um, not on the workforce housing side, more in the moderate to, to higher end of the um, pricing point. The Villas at Lexwood um, is right um, adjacent to George Washington Carver, um, and it's a concept site plan that was reviewed um, 
by TEC in October, um, seven attached dwelling units, um, 40 total um, townhomes. Meadows at Town Run 2 is in the town of Leonardtown. It did get their concept um, approval by the town's planning and zoning in January um, for an additional 303 units that would be comprised of 12 single family units, 147 townhomes, and 144 apartments, which would close out their project in that area. And then the last one I want to talk about is Stewart's Grant. Um, Stewart's Grant uh, PUD was originally approved in 1997. It goes back a long ways. Um, they have received minor PUD amendments um, in March of 2020, um, March 27th of 2023, which reduced the units down to 1,122. Um, they do have their concept site planning hearing on April 7th. Um, the determination of adequate, adequacy of public schools will be by the planning director, not the planning commission. Um, and this is per an amendment to the PUD amendment that was made in 2004, which gave that determination to the planning director. Um, this, is, um, this is a very large development. Um, we'll have a very um, long build out. It won't be something that happens quickly, but will happen over time, um, and we'll have um, direct impacts on our schools that are, are directly adjacent to, um, to the site. So we talk about current housing market and some trends. Um, as I said, it had been moderate, moderately um, balanced out, and we hadn't been growing that much. Um, home prices then you know, really took off before the interest rate changes, and were really skyrocketing. Um, right now, they are declining slightly. Listings are staying on the market longer, and there are fewer sales. Um, not as many new listings, and the average sold price to the original um, price listed is down. Uh, as of January 2023, um, the units sold was 76, which was down almost 28%, and the total sales volume was down almost 30%. Um, the average days on the market had increased by 28 days to 46, and the median sold price was 342,000, um, which was down about 4%, um, and this was um, based on some information that the Baynet provided from Southern Maryland Association of Realtors. Um, if you still look at these, the median sold price is $342,000. Um, when I have the opportunity, I'm always advocating, as Ms. Doran information presented, we need workforce housing, we need livable housing for our community. Um, and as I presented, a lot of these developments that are coming forth are not um, conducive to some of those needs. Um, and the market dictates what happens in a community. Um, but we as the school system will continue, I will continue to advocate for workforce housing for not only our staff, but all of the other um, county agencies that have a need for that as well. Um, we'll continue to monitor these, and if um, developments change, we'll definitely bring it back to you and let you know what is changing. We just wanted to give you an update on where we were, and um, there is the big hearing on Monday. Okay. Anyone? Any questions? Okay. Thank you. Um, this is how... Um, the total, uh, I think you projected 2,415 units, 1,005 students, about 40%. I'm just curious, um, I, I, would, I would think that you'd have more students per household than 40%. Where did you get that data? So the, the data for the student yield was developed back in the 1990s. It was a committee that got together to do that. Um, we continued to monitor that when we were doing a lot of redistricting. We were continuing to look at those numbers. I think some of the circumstances have continued to change, um, and it, it is time probably to relook at that. So as part of the excise tax um, exercise that they did, the consultant did look at it, and the number, interestingly enough, came out to be very similar. Um, there will be houses that have no students, and there will be houses that have four or five. In the end, when you look at it as a collective, it does mm -hmm. average out to be about that. What I will tell you is that we've seen um, we've seen different um, events, COVID being one of them, that can cause multi-families to move together and have a multi-generational um, home, um, and then that can really concentrate growth. When you start talking about um, the the workforce housing, we can see a higher um, concentration of growth 
um, within those. It, it really, I think it's something that needs to be, and the Planning Commission has, has addressed this before, it's probably something we need to go back and revisit is to look at some of these. Um, there was a workforce housing um, plan done. Um, I sat on that committee. It was a really good work group. Um, I, I think it is time probably to start talking about what changes need to happen to some of the documentation and where we need to head. Comprehensive plan is currently the zoning ordinance is being updated. Um, the, the comprehensive plan is. So there's opportunity to have further dialogue about what we need and a lot of agencies have, have spoken during those work sessions about this exact topic. Uh, how do you calculate adequacy? How do you look at student yield? And what do we need and where do we want to go as a county? I'm thinking uh, uh, Francis Duke, there's a lot of new housing developments mm -hmm. in that school's area. And traditionally, at least from my experience, new, new housing attracts younger couples. Younger couples have children. Um, and so when you have these new developments, it would seem to me that uh, that percentage of 40% is low, but that's that's just my opinion. The second question I have is uh, Leonardtown. Uh, I, I, is it um, Tudor Grand or what's the new, the new development? I, I, Tudor I Hall, but that's been on the books. It's since been on the books for a long time. We moved time. here in '96. I understand. Um, and it's it's they've never done anything with it. Um, but you know when you look at the way the way Leonardtown is districted, so the students who live in um, Clark's Rest, those students um, go to Leonardtown Elementary. They don't go to Captain Walter Francis Duke. Um, Leonard's Grant goes to um, to Duke, but um, but but that large development on five those students all go to Leonardtown Elementary School. The point was, the recommendation that came before us um, was to, to divide that um, so that the capacity of, of each school would not be um, overstretched. Of course, that, would, that, that calculus would change if uh, Tudor Hall became a development, correct? Right, but when we did that, we did look at Leonardtown, and Leonardtown has the capacity to grow. Um, so we did kind of look at dividing the Route 5 side versus the Leonardtown Hollywood Road side and trying to separate it. The other piece of this that's really important is someone can look at this and say, oh, we're getting all of these new developments and that's going to generate new students to our school system because new families are going to move in. But there is a, there is a, a generational group of young um, individuals who have a certain home and they're going to buy up and they're going to move into these developments, but that frees up the home that they're in. And historically what we have seen is when new developments come in like this, the whole population of the county isn't going to grow. We're going to move. We're, we're going to, to, to move things around. And in my career, I've been with the system for a while, like I've seen the rebirth personally of Town Creek Elementary School right. and that community several times. The, the population will age out, the, the new families will move in and they'll have families. So this will create more to me of a shell game of who's moving where um, and then we have to, to look at how we rebalance that, but it isn't going to be this infusion of a whole new group of families. Um, no. we're, we're very different than, say, like Loudoun County in Virginia, where lots of new houses came in, new population moved there, which then meant they had to have a massive build-out of new schools. Mm -hmm. That is, is not and has not been happening in this community. I mean, when you look at the fact that, um, you know, 25 years ago, the population of the county was at about 110 to 115. We're up at about 123. Mm -hmm. It's not a huge infusion of people. Mm -hmm. um, the, the infrastructure of the county just doesn't, ha won't handle that. Um, so, so some of our growth is limited by, um, by accessibility and, and affordable, affordable housing, you know, a lot of different things. $400,000 home cannot be, is not within the affordability rate for the, when 40% of all of our students are living at or below poverty, mm -hmm. right? And the average home costs $400,000. Understand there is an incredible gulf between the have and have nots. And the majority of the building that they're going to be putting in, it's not going to, these, they're going to be more than four hundred thousand dollars. The you know the four hundred the three hundred thousand dollars are going to be for townhomes. Mm -hmm. um, it is, you know. This of course, is, the the it, argument too is that four hundred thousand is a bargain for somebody that lives in uh, 
Northern Virginia or you know in Bethesda or something like that, they might come down. Um, I, I just know that because I've built a lot of schools in my career, the lead time is incredible. I mean, just the 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 time to to get it approved, to get it permitted, and then get it through design, and then get it getting it uh, bidded for uh, bid for construction and going through all of that vetting, then breaking ground and building. It takes a long time, you know. In a federal building, it's seven years uh, for being a point of construction from the time you start. So I understand that we there's a lead time there, and I know the Dr. Smith reported to the uh, county commissioners that we didn't need any new capital space now. Yeah, no, I mean we're we're still and, at seventeen thousand uh, five hundred kids. We're probably going to be seventeen thousand seven hundred kids. We have capacity at all levels. I mean, we have capacity ultimately to absorb a thousand students if we put them, if we redistrict and keep moving things around. Um, the, the fact that you have to have, you have to have 50 percent and the other 50 percent by the time you're finished, that's, somebody is going to have to ultimately make the decision to forward fund a school and not necessarily have the state contribution right. um, until you're completed and uh, and then even then perhaps not. So that's, I mean, that is a decision that's gonna ultimately have to be made by the county. And the, the other way we have, we've really looked at this is, and it's evolved over time and will continue to evolve is the programs that we offer and how we how we utilize our buildings and, and, and offer the programs that we need. Um, you know, we've talked about this many times, and Alan will, will have heard me talk about this, you know, we do have students that are out on, they, they go to work or they go to college or they're at the Forest Center for a period of time. So when you look at the numbers, it's hard to understand that, yes, this is an additional 300 high school students that will be coming in, but it'll be over a long period of time. Um, but there are moving dynamics to where students are in their day, especially at the high school level, that assist us with meeting our needs. And for some of the developments that you have here, the, the luxury apartments um, at First Colony, uh, you know, I'm not sure how many of those luxury apartments are actually going to have um, students in them. Um, that, you know, families with, with children, um, I'm not sure that, that, depending on what those look like, that may not be the, the spot where they go and, and stay. Mm -hmm. um, but. That definitely might be families who are downsizing after their kids go off to college or something like that. Someone so. who's here for a temporary, mm -hmm. you know, te temporary assignment. There's there's all kinds of things. There so. could be something associated with the base where they're they're coming down, staying here during the week, and then they're going back to their definitely. family for you know the, the weekend. weekend. Um, it, it is definitely um, a more professional um, environment that they're they're creating. Yeah. And Bill, this is the information that is tracked by the state superintendent of education to see if buildings need to be considered no, to no, be no, no, that's no. Us. All local. We do it. All local. Oh, we do. Yes, yeah, so this, this is what we're doing so okay. that okay. as we start talking about, um, the, we watch the enrollment and we look at what um, proposals we might need to make, but we're looking at this for long term of do we need to change our capital plan or do we need to look at how we might need to balance um, schools in the, in the long run. A project like um, Stewart's grant, you're talking 15, 18 oh, yeah. years over a long period of time. Mm -hmm. So you have the opportunity to start looking and forecasting and making plans of how you're going to address the enrollment as it changes over time. And the, the last time we saw a huge infusion was during BRAC. Mm -hmm. um, and that was the last time this county really truly grew tremendously and there was a big housing boom and we were building schools. Right now, we're just in that pattern of meeting our needs and making some minor adjustments as necessary between schools. Yeah, um, I really appreciate the, the slide that you have up. If you look across the top there, um, where she has elementary 0.215, middle 0.107, and high 0.154, that is the factor by which you um, multiply uh, this um, to, to, to determine how many students you expect from that particular um, amount of housing, um, but but as Mrs. House said, um, you know there's there is a science to it, but there's an art to it as well. Um, and and Mrs. Howe is very experienced in um, being able to look at what the particular type of housing is and say, 
this is what the proje projection is, but our experience is that we're likely to get more students here or fewer students here. Um, so. And on average, um, the, the market can sustain a developer to build uh, 20 to 30 homes a year is what the market has sustained. Um, so if you if you look at these, you know, 2,400, if it's it's each one's doing 30, it's going to take a really long time. Um, there, we'll there's another talking. equation too. I don't know how how much impact, but migrants. Uh, we had a, a, an executive meeting. We were talking about the need for ESAW teachers. So we have uh, another segment of the population that may or may not be influ uh, an influx into our county. I'm, I'm sure you're considering that as well. Mm -hmm. we, we're looking at, like I said, multi-generational has been, multi-family generational has been one of our biggest challenges that we've had. And looking at Ms. Doran's numbers, uh, you know, I can see that being a um, correlation. And that's one of the things I look at. I look at the housing, but I also look at the free and reduced meal status for each school and start to develop some, some conclusions. One of the things that really impacts St. Mary's County if the northern portion of the county was not rural and didn't have the if it had water and it had sewer and it was zoned as a higher density um, i do think this county would grow, would grow. in a heartbeat oh, yeah. it would grow but to try and get from if you're coming from charles county and you're trying to come down um, to st mary's to be a bedroom community you really have to hop all the way down to leonardtown to get to a higher density and that is that adds a long commute for someone um, so I don't think um, we'll be impacted by that in the near future. Um, water and sewer isn't available there. There's no plans to change that. So I, th I think that gap has always sort of kind of insulated us from some of that growth coming down right. from the yeah, north. Us, yeah. I'm not sure it wasn't planned either. But well, that's, that's another subject. It, it is the rural portion of the county. At a certain point, we'd like to build a wall. And then another, no. if the bridge broke, <laughs> that's fine too. We just stay down here. We're good. Yes, we are. Don't we are, leave we are the good county. Right now. Don't leave the county. Oh my gosh, Dr. Smith, I'm so, definitely leaving. No, the stay. I love it here, but I gotta go. There's gonna be some beautiful places to live. I'll tell you that. <laughs> yes, I will. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. Well, all right, Ms. McCord. My document isn't opening at all. Oh no. <laughs> we're, we're batting a thousand. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Before you is the March financial report on the revenue side of the $254.4 million budget. We've received revenues totaling $235.4 million, representing 92% of our budget. On the expenditure side, uh, there are two areas I'd like to draw your attention to for special education. The out-of-county transfers, uh, that is in a deficit position right now. However, at a categorical level, we anticipate that we will be fine at the end of the year. Um, as mentioned at the last board meeting, um, we have a concern with regard to our group health. Um, although this particular line on the screen looks fine, uh, Care First maintains an actual claims position and that claims position is currently in a deficit posture. We will not um, recognize that financially until the retrospective agreement um, is performed or our reconciliation is performed at the end of the fiscal year. However, we are carefully monitoring that. We will likely need to do a uh, categorical amendment over the summer for that particular category. Um, of the expenditures, we have $81.8 million encumbered. Total encumbrances and year-to-date expenses are $242.4 million, representing 95% of our budget. Are there any questions? Anyone? No. Thank you. On the ledger, when you transfer money, you can transfer money between the same category. That's correct. But 
if it goes to another category that has to be approved by the board. And by the commissioners. And by the county commissioners. And yes. by the, oh, and yep. by the county Correct. commissioners. Okay. And then the only thing that I saw was on the entry for 314, I didn't see 7395, that account number, in category 15, but I could have been, I don't know, it was late when I was looking at it still. So is that correct? Um, this is. Uh, You're looking at the reallocation it's funds for cafeteria payables from yeah. right. that Piney Point. You so may not have seen it initially. Um, it may have been a new account they recreated. Um, oh. That is not a frequently used account. Uh, this is for um, items that are typically purchased within category 10, but may also be purchased within category 15. Okay. So now that has moved over to category 15. So it could have been in 10, is that what you were? Um, account 7395 should have already been there. It's account 7505 that was likely the new account created. But I can go back and, and take a look at that for you. Okay, got it. Because that's a capitalized items account. Okay, yeah, it is. Okay. Any additional questions? Okay. Thank you. Okay, all right, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, let's see. Our next board meeting, Wednesday, April 26, 2023, at 5 o'clock, the day after the public hearing on the budget. So, with that, we are adjourned.